thank you. Well, Moon and I are childhood friends. We've known each other since the last century, and we've actually grown together ever since, and we've been collaborating together. When we were children, we used to talk a lot, and we used to like enjoying nature and talking about other animal species, and we also like to compare our perception of reality. Uh, so we were always talking about uh, what it would be like to sense uh, things that we can sense, what it would be like to be an ant, or what would it be like to be another species. So we used to talk a lot about nature more than science fiction or, or technology. We were more into uh, nature and other species. And what we also compared a lot was vision, because I, I was born completely colorblind, so I've never seen color. I've never seen blue, yellow, pink. I have achromatism, which is total colorblindness. So that's something that was very different between us, that I would see things in grayscale and she would see colors. She would see things that I wouldn't see. So we were the same species, but we had different perception of reality. To me, seeing grayscale was fine. Uh, I, I enjoy seeing in grayscale because I see better at night vision. So at night, I would see better than moon. But during the day, she would see things that I wouldn't see. Also, I see longer distances, because if you don't see color, you can see longer distances. And I memorize shapes more easily, because color doesn't distract me. But I could ignore the existence of color, because color is mentioned every single day, uh, like in elements that are uh, things that are very common, like Bluetooth, uh, Green Peace, Red Cross, uh, Yellow Pages, Pink Panther, the Green Card, James Brown, it's in his last name. And also this huge country called Greenland as well. So I kept hearing the names of colors, and I couldn't ignore the existence of it. Also, when you use uh, tap water, like hot water and cold water, sometimes there's only a color code. Or maps, this is fine. But if I go to Tokyo, I can get easily lost, because some <laughs> maps only use color codes. And then when I was at school learning flags, I had this situation where <laughs> three countries share exactly the same flag. And if someone asked me, have you seen a man with ginger hair, blue eyes, and dressed in pink? I would have absolutely no idea if I've seen this man. Because the only information I get here is that the man has hair, that he has eyes, and that he's not naked. So <laughs> the reason why I wanted uh, to sense color was not because of the beauty of color, uh, but because of the social aspect of, of it, that it's, it's commonly used, very, very used. I decided I would study music because I thought music will not have color. And I wanted to focus my life on the piano, a black and white instrument. I thought that will be a black and white world. But when, when, I, studied, when I was studying music, I realized there's many theories related really, to color and, and sound as well. Newton did this theory centuries ago. And after him, there's been many more. There's many theories that relate color with sound. And actually, it's true. They're both frequencies. Color is a light frequency, and sound is an audio frequency. So, in 2003, when I was studying music composition, I started a project with Adam Montandone in order to create a third eye that would allow me to hear the actual frequencies of light. So if we had a, some kind of third eye that would allow us to sense the vibrations of color, but instead of seeing them, we would hear them, we would hear a note for each color. Because red, for example, is around 430 millions of millions of waves per second. So that's a note, a musical note that we can't hear because it's too high and it's a different type of frequency. But if we could hear that frequency, we would hear a note between F and F sharp. So the aim was to create a software that would scale down the light frequencies to audible frequencies so that I would be able to hear colors. So the first prototype was a webcam connected to a 5 kilo computer and a pair of headphones that was scaling down the frequencies of light to audible frequencies. So I was able to hear a note for each color, and I memorized the names that you give to each color. And I had this for several months until I memorized all the visual colors. And this allowed me to hear a note for each degree of the color wheel. That's 360 microtones in an octave, and it's in sine waves, so very pure waves. Now we hear in shades of orange, going up to shades of orange, yellow, and then yellow. So it's very, very microtonal. And it took me three years to memorize all these microtones and the names that you would give to all these colors. And this color also has another property, which is saturation. So we have different levels of saturation depending on the saturation level. So if it's very loud, it means it's very saturated. If it's a low, it's a soft color. Then um, I, was, uh, I didn't play the piano anymore. I started painting pianos, because to me, color became my musical instrument. So I was painting colors on top of the piano, and I was amplifying the sound of the colors to the audience, and that was piano concerts. And my final music composition portfolio was not a score, but uh, different paintings. So to me, each color is a note. So I can compose music by painting different colors on a, on a piece of paper. When I was able to sense all the visual colors, I didn't see why I should stop there, because there's many other species that can sense colors that we cannot sense, like infrareds and ultraviolets. So in 2007, 2008, 
I decided to extend my perception of color to near infrared and near ultraviolet. So since then, I can sense more colors in the visual spectrum. And this means that I can continuously extend my perception of color beyond the visual spectrum, because through sound, you can hear much more than through the eyes. So that allows me to perceive uh, colors that are not only invisible to me, but invisible to other humans. But they're visible for other, or perceptive, perceptive for other animal species. The aim is to continuously extend the perception of color. The other aim was uh, not to use or wear technology. I wanted to become technology. I didn't want to have a wearable device. I wanted to have a new sensory organ. First, I thought of having a third eye implanted in the middle of my head, but that would only limit my perception of color to what is in front of me. So then I looked at nature, and I saw that there's many species that have antennas. So I thought that the best option would have would be to have a new sensory organ, an antenna, implanted in my head that would allow me to perceive colors through vibrations in my bone instead of using my ears. Vibrations inside my bone that then would become sounds to my inner ear. So I looked at nature, so there's many types of antennas. The one I was more interested in was the cetaceous type of antenna, more circular. So it would allow me to sense colors 360 degrees, because I can turn the antenna around so I, I can sense colors behind me or beside me without being connected to my site. And then when the antenna was designed, I looked uh, and tried to find a doctor willing to do the surgery. And I said, would, would it be possible to have this, an antenna implant? And I said, sorry, we don't do this here. We don't do antenna implants. You'll have to talk to a bioethical committee. So I proposed the surgery to a bioethical committee. And then they said, no, that this is not ethical, because uh, doctors only regenerate pre-existing senses, or they regenerate pre-existing body parts, but creating a new sense uh, of, of color that goes beyond the spectrum was not ethical. And also having a new organ was not ethical. So I tried to find a doctor willing to do the surgery anonymously, and I found one. And then we did it on a Monday, his day off. And then we rented the room, and he did the surgery there. So that's my head facing down. We, reduce, we removed some hair. We reduced the skin. And my head was drilled four times, different implants. One is for the chip that vibrates inside my head. Two other implants are the structure of the antenna. And we decided to add a fourth implant, which is internet connection, so that I can then receive colors from other parts of the world, not only the antenna, but people can also send colors to my head or can connect to external devices. So it took two months for the antenna and my head to merge. So now the antenna is part of my skeleton. So if uh, someone pulls the antenna, it's impossible to remove it because it's inside my bone. And I had to get used to my new height. I'm officially taller now. <laughs> Internet connection, I have five people in the world that have permission to send colors to my head. They can do it through their mobile phones, so they can stream live images directly to my head. So if there's a beautiful sunset in Australia now, someone in Melbourne can actually use the mobile phone to stream the live images of the sunset to my head. So I could be here, but sensing uh, the colors of a sunset. Or if someone sends me colors at night, then they can actually influence my dreams. So if I wake up and I realize I dreamt of violet people and violet houses, it's probably because someone was sending me violet colors at night. So my friends can actually color my dreams, or they can change the way I dream because of the colors they send. So we're using the internet as a sense here. So the internet is not being used as a tool or a communication tool. It's more of a, a way of sharing a sense, in this case, sharing color perception. And also, it's a way of extending my senses beyond my body. My brain has changed. This is an MRI of my brain. Doctors cannot tell what, what is happening to my brain. They don't know if I'm looking at an image or hearing a sound, because my brain reacts in the same way. Both the visual and the audio cortex are always active. So I feel I'm a cyborg, because I feel that there's no wall between the software and my brain. I feel my uh, brain and the software have united and given me this new sense. So I identify as a cyborg, as a biological cyborg, because I feel united to cybernetics. Cyborg comes from the union between cybernetics and organism. And that's why I tried to explain to the UK government in 2004, because they didn't allow me to renew my passport, because they said that there was some kind of electronic equipment on the picture. And there's this law that says electronic equipment is not allowed on passport photos. So I told them that this is a body part. And I told them that I felt that I was a cyborg, a union between cybernetics and an organism. And in the end, they allowed me to appear in the passport of 2004 with this first prototype. And this allows me to travel freely around the world, because airports don't usually like technology. So if you are technology, they don't like you very much. So this is part of um, uh, uh, important to have it in the passport. Now I'm applying for Swedish citizenship, because the material in my head is Swedish. So uh, my body, part of my body is Swedish. So I'm telling them that uh, I should also be allowed to apply for Swedish citizenship. So I'm um, still in conversations with the Swedish government. Hopefully, they'll say 
Yes. And if they say, yes, I guess each country might have different laws, saying that if you have a body part that is from the UK, maybe you need to have it for seven years. And then after seven years, you can apply for British citizenship if you had the body part that is British. And maybe the US might be longer, maybe 10. I don't know. We'll see. So hopefully, we'll have, I'll have a reply soon. Yeah. So I, as I grew up with Neil, I could uh, go with him and experience all his developments. And there was a point that he was actually better in perceiving color than, than night. So he extend the perception of color. So I kind of got jealous. And I wanted also to extend my perception of something. And I was studying dance. And I'm a choreographer, so I'm very interested in movement. I, and I wanted to perceive movement in a deeper way. And I knew that using technology to do that would help me. To do that, so I I thought, what, how could I perceive movement? Like, what sense of movement can we have as that humans don't have? And the first thing I thought it was that uh, we can we don't have the sense of a speed by by ourselves. So I used this, uh, I mean, like a, this kind of glove, and I would point of people, and then when people were uh, were walking in front of the glove, I could know the speed of the people walking in front of me. And then that was not that useful because I had to point on people, and then uh, that gave me an information. And I didn't want to have information. I wanted to have a sense, like a feeling of speed. So uh, the next step was to, to transform these into an earrings. So every time that someone was walking from right to left, I would feel a vibration on my right ear and then on my left ear. And then depending on the vibration uh, of the interval of each vibration, I would know the speed of the people walking in front of me. So then I would, uh, if I, and I had this for a long time, and then with my eyes closed, I would be able to know and what, um, the, uh, what speed the people was walking in front of me. So it was like a sense and then a vibration. And then after wearing this for some, some time, like just focusing on the, on the speed that I had in front, one day I realized that maybe I could turn the earrings around. And then this opened a whole, um, a whole space awareness of myself. So suddenly, because I could uh, already see movement with my eyes in front of me, but in the back of our body, I feel that our senses are very, we, we don't have many senses. It's like very close sensory, but our, in the backs of our bodies. So this opened a whole space, and I could feel presence behind me. So every time someone was walking, was walking towards me, I could feel presence through the vibrations uh, on my ears. Then I. I was perceiving this movement all around me through, through the vibrations, through the people and objects. And there was a point that um, I, I didn't want that the, my movement perception depend on people or objects around me. So I thought uh, that I needed to perceive a movement that it would be more universal, that didn't come from people or objects, that I could be alone in the planet and still feel movement. And then I realized that not only humans move, there are many things that move all around us and in many different ways. And the planet itself is constantly moving. It not only rotates by itself and around the, the sun, but it, it moves constantly through and shakes constantly through earthquakes. And earthquakes is a massive movement that most of the times we don't feel it. And I thought it would be fascinating to transform, to transform this massive movement to, to one body. And so then I thought that I could perceive the, the earthquakes of the earth through my body. And then now I have uh, an implant in my arm that vibrates every time there's an earthquake anywhere in the planet. So depending on the intensity of the earthquake, the vibration I feel in my arm is stronger or lower. And I call this the, the seismic sense. Um, yes, uh, that would be it. And then, the <laughs> and then what we do, like we see this, Neil, the extension of the news, Neil and I, we see this as an art. So the, uh, the artwork of a cyborg artist would be the creation of a new sense. Um, the, so my artwork would be the seismic sense, and Neil's artwork would be the, the intent of the percept this new sense that he calls uh, sonochromatic sense. But it's a sense that happens inside our own body. So we are the only audience of our own art. So in order to share our experience, we create external artwork. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's external art like, that reveals our experience of reality. So cyborg art is like taking a picture. When you take a picture, 
the art of taking a picture is one thing, and then the art of uh, developing the film is another part. You can either just take the picture, and that could be art that only experience the photographer, or you can uh, cho choose to develop this film and share this uh, with other people. So in the case of cyborg art, it's the same. We are experiencing our own art, which is the, the experience of this new sense, and then we decide to reveal this experience through external artworks. Or, by the way we, we live. Also, in my case, before I would dress in a way that it would look good, now I dress in a way that it sounds good to me. So I decide which notes I want to wear. If I wear this color combination, I, I'm dressed in C major, so I, I'm, I'm wearing a major chord, so I would dress like this in happy occasions. This is a minor chord. I would dress like this in funerals, so that's a, a sad chord. Or I can also wear songs. So I'm designing clothes with a friend so that I can wear specific melodies. This is a tie that sounds like electronic music, so I really like a piece of electronic music. The tie, if I listen to it, I hear the electronic music. So the longer the tie, the longer the melody. You can choose how long you want it. Also, the way I, I, I see houses has changed. Now, my living room, for example, is painted in uh, C major, pink, blue, and yellow. So the, when I go inside, it's major chord. The floor is all red, because red is the lowest frequency. So it is the lowest sound. So it gives a profound sound to the whole house. Then the exit door is, uh, is um, green, because green is in the middle of the spectrum. So it gives a, it's like a tuning fork before you go out, outside. The ceilings are black and white, because it's silent. So if I lie down, then it's all silent. Uh, then the kitchen is, uh, oh no, my bedroom has three colors. It's uh, turquoise, pink, and, um, p and violet, so it's the notes are B, E, and D, bed. So it makes sense for me to have <laughs> it, the, these three colors in the bedroom. And then in the in the kitchen, it's violet. Violet is the highest pitch, so it gives it uh, keeps me alert. So it's a color that we don't usually eat, so it's, it doesn't interfere with food. Food has changed a lot as well, because when I eat, I hear different notes. So I can actually compose music with food. Depending on how I put the food on the plate, I can eat songs. And I'm collaborating with a restaurant in Barcelona where we are, uh, there's a, a, a new plate, uh, a chromophone, where you put the food on top, and then you rotate the plate, and then you can hear the food. So you can go to the restaurant and ask for some music. You can ask for Mozart, and then they serve you the different colors, and then you turn around and you hear Mozart piece, or you can ask for some Lady Gaga dessert, and then you can hear some Lady Gaga dessert. So uh, this was actually presented three days ago in, in San Francisco, and, and we're doing some experimental uh, sonochromatic dinners where people eat different songs. So now I can compose music as well by looking at things. Instead of playing an instrument, I can just look at different colors, and then I hear the music in my head, and then I can choose to also share this experience by amplifying the sounds of my head to the audience. So then the color concerts, I use bone-conducted bone headphones or Bluetooth to amplify the sounds of my head to the audience, and then I can play different types of food or objects. Also, my experience of walking around a supermarket has changed a lot because there's lots of colors there, so there's lots of music, especially the aisles with cleaning products. That's the most exciting aisle of a supermarket because it has very, very loud and unexpected colors, and it's usually very pop, uh, pop music there. Milk is silent, so <laughs> white elements and black elements are completely silent. It's not only supermarkets, it's also art. Now I can listen to a Picasso, I can listen to an Andy Warhol. All painters have become composers, so my experience of walking around the MoMA is like a, a music experience. I can listen to different melodies, and also each composer, or well, each painter sounds different. I can hear the scream, for example. And Andy Warhol, for example, sounds very loud, because it's very saturated, so you can hear an Andy Warhol from the other end of the museum, usually, because it's very loud, whereas all the paintings sound less, because they're less saturated. The way I sense people, as well, has changed, because when I look at someone, I hear their face. And what I like doing is, instead of drawing their face, I write down the notes of people's face, like the sound of the eyes, the lips, the skin, the hair, and then I send them an MP3 of their face, so they, they can hear themselves. The first one was a Prince Charles. I asked Prince Charles if I could listen to his face, and this was his reaction when I asked him. <laughs> Each person sounds different. Judy Dench has silent hair, like a glass of milk, so she has this very silent uh, hair. Uh, James Cameron has very loud skin, a high-pitched shade of um, skin. Al Gore has different notes in his eyes, different shades of turquoise, so different notes in each eye. Tim Berners-Lee has a very odd sound of eyelid, so his eyelids sound very unusual. Marina Abramovich is very silent, uh, almost uh, uh, silent uh, all her, but the lips are very loud and very low. Uh, Steve Wozniak's eyes sound like green apples, so very pure as well. Moby sounds very little, so he has one note missing, no hair, so he has less notes than other people. 
Woody Allen sounds like an old painting, very unsaturated. Macaulay Culkin, C major, a major chord. It's unusual to find major chords, where uh, Philip Glass sounds very microtonal, very similar to his music. <laughs> and Bono had very, very loud glasses in this case. His glasses were violet and very saturated. If you wear makeup, then you sound very different. Uh, if, if you would hear your face, you would not use red lipstick. You would use green lipstick, because the sound of green sounds very good with the skin. So uh, if we would hear color, most people would wear green lipstick and then some blue here because then it sounds C major or you have F sharp major in the face. I'm not a fan of that. You didn't like it, no. Mm. And then uh, <laughs> what really surprised me is that people who say they're black, they're not black, and people who say they're white, they're not white. People who say they're black, they're very, very dark orange, and people who say they're white, they're very, very light orange. So the fact that people say that humans are black and white is completely false. We are all different shades of orange. Very light orange or very dark orange. This is a color wheel. There's a reddish orange or, or yellowish orange, and then there's different shades of light. I can also do face concerts where instead of playing the objects of colors, I play the audience's colors. So I, I look at the faces, the audience's, the audience cues, and then I start creating rhythms with the sound of the eyes, the hair, the lips of the audience, and I create layers of sound. So it's electronic music created by by the colors of the, the audience. If the concert sounds really bad, it's their fault, because that's where <laughs> the music comes from. Uh, the last uh, face concert was of Prince Albert II of Monaco. He liked the sound of his face so much that he's using it as his ringtone. So when people <laughs> call him, he hears his face. <laughs> the secondary effect of hearing color is that sounds also become colors. So if, if I hear the line, uh, telephone line for me is green mostly. It, it creates the, the frequency of green. And I can also paint music. This is Mozart's Queen of the Night, note by note, from the center to the end. This is also music. This is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber, from the first note to the last. Also, when we speak, we use different frequencies, so I can transpose speeches uh, into color. One of them is uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and the other one is a, a speech by Hitler. They look very different, because they used very different types of frequencies when they spoke. Also, uh, colors I use now uh, with musicians, so musicians learn the sound of color, and then the day of the concert, colors are projected on stage, and that's the score. So they play the colors that are projected in this, on, the, on the stage. And also, there's uh, public sculptures that use the sonochromatic scale as well. So in this case, this is a, a song. You can download an app on your mobile phone, and then you walk underneath the sculpture, and then you can listen to a melody. And at night, it changes colors, so you can actually hear music by pointing your phone at the sculpture that keeps changing colors. Uh, the reaction that people I've had with people through the years has changed. I've, the fact of having an antenna means that people stop me every day since 2004, and they ask me what it is, or they, they just laugh and they leave. Uh, the thing is that it's changed. In 2004, many people thought it was a reading light, that I had some kind of, uh, that it would turn on. And they asked me, can you turn the light on? And it's not the light. So they thought it was a reading light. In 2005, six, they thought it was a microphone for internet chat. In 2007, they thought it was a Bluetooth phone, like a taxi driver started having hands-free phones, so they thought it was some kind of phone. In 2009, people thought it was something to do with GoPro, that I was filming my life. In 2012, uh, people started to think it was something to do with Google, Google Glass. So it was, was uh, sometimes connected. In 2014, 15, they thought it was, well, children asked me if it was some kind of extendable selfie stick. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, lately, for the last three, three months, people point at me and they say Pokemon. They thought it, I think it was <laughs> about Pokemon. They try to catch me sometimes. So it keeps changing what people think it is. Hopefully, in the 2020s, people will just think it's an antenna and it's a new sensory organ, but it's still not happening. This yeah. One, one way of the sharing is also like we created these cyborg sculptures. One is like a 3D version of my arm, and the other one is like 3D version of Neil's head, and it was exhibited in Barcelona. And my arm would, uh, would be connected to the online seismographs like my own arm, and people were able to touch it, and whenever there, isn't, there was an earthquake, they could feel it. And we call it like cyborg sculpture because it's a, uh, a sculpture connected to a living organism. In my case, it was the Earth. And in Neil's case, it was connected actually to Neil's head. Yeah, so people in the uh, gallery, they could send colors to my head live. So one of the five connections in the world for six months, it was the sculpture in the museum. So I kept receiving colors from visitors of the museum. It was overwhelming because uh, there were schools there as well. So they were sending lots of colors every, every day. 
Yeah, my, one of my ways to, to share is also doing a performance that it's called Waiting for Earthquakes, where I stand still uh, on a place and then I wait for an earthquake to take place, which is very often. And whatever happens, I move according to the intensity of the earthquake. So it's a durational piece, it doesn't have beginning or an end. It can last 10 minutes, or it can last hours. And it's just, uh, it's like a duel between the earth and myself. The, the earth is like the choreographer of the piece, and I'm just it interpreting the real data that is coming through. And it's, it's like an invitation to the audience just to, to listen for a while the, the, the natural movement of the earth. And also, I wanted to say that um, when the first uh, time I had to add this, the seismic sense, uh, at the beginning I had to get used to feel all these vibrations every day, and maybe. If there was a big one in the middle of the night, uh, I would wake up. But at the end, like now, I'm more used to it, and and now it feels like having two two heartbeats. Like I have my own, and then this constant vibration in my arm, and I, it's like having yeah two beats, like the earth the earth beat, and then my heartbeat, like at the same time. And also do this piece uh, sometimes in, in different places in New York. I have this this cube and. Uh, suddenly, I appear somewhere in the street, and, uh, and I have a paper explaining what I do. And this was, uh, I was in, in the middle of the night waiting in Times Square, and some people laid down also. So it's like, it, it can be, it can be, it's a piece that it can be anywhere, because it's just me standing there waiting for an, earth, an earthquake. So, yeah, like when, well, yeah, that's it. And then uh, my other my other thing is uh, I do it uh, with percussion that I'm, we're gonna show. So I I, I can do seismic I, I call it like seismic percussion. Where the earth in this case would be like the composer of the piece. I can play the the earthquakes that happen in real time through the drums. And I I also create uh, a scores like they did look like this. For example, when I performed in Mexico, I researched all the earthquakes that, that, that had, had taken place in, ex, in Mexico for the last 50 years, and I made a score that lasted uh, eight minutes. So during the eight minutes, I played all the seismic activity that had happened in that place. So it was a very vivid and very a strong, a strong score. So the, yeah, the, uh, the score is based on the same seismic activity of in a specific place. And I also transform these into into paintings. This is like a hundred a century of earthquakes in the U.S. that I also have in a score, but this is transformed into a painting. And I also did uh, when I was doing the the speed of of the people walking in front of me. Uh, actually, Nina and I traveled around and around Europe hitchhiking, and the aim was to arrive to every capital. And I would uh, define every, each capital with the speed of the citizens walking on it, because I realized that depending of your context, or depending where you are, you tend to walk faster or slower. I'm like I'm amazed of this common movement sense that we have, like uh, involuntary movement speed. That we share. So I made like a dictionary that defined each capital of Europe by its movement, and Neil defined each capital of Europe by the dominant color of the cities. Yeah, like in 2010, Neil and I created like the Cyborg Foundation, basically with three aims. One is like to help humans to become cyborgs. Uh, second one would be the, to defend the cyborg rights, and the third one is to promote cyborgism as an art and social movement. I've We've done different yeah. projects, but uh, we'll talk more about the, the following projects. In ne next week, we're going to Brazil, and we'll be developing teeth. I, I have some spaces in my mouth and some teeth missing. So instead of having no normal teeth implanted, we'll create uh, teeth that do things. Like um, we did a prototype some years ago. It's a teeth that creates light. So in total darkness, you can click, and then you open your mouth, and then you have some emergency light. <laughs> the case with it was that when I was eating, the light was going on and off all the time. So we had it removed. And now in Brazil, we'll try to make one here that will actually also charge by, by uh, pressing it. And it, it should create light um, in another system that doesn't go on and off when I eat. And then the other space is that we're going to try to create a Bluetooth tooth that will allow me to control the antenna. So uh, if I want my antenna to move left, uh, I'll be able to use my teeth to move it left and then right. So it will allow me to, like a joystick, but inside, inside the mouth, and control through Bluetooth. 
either this or the third option will be that we'll create two teeth because Moon now also has a, yeah. a tooth missing, so that's good for us because she has some <laughs> space. And then we'll also use uh, the creation of Bluetooth teeth in this case, to communicate. So we both know the Morse code. So if we both have a tooth that can transfer the clicks, then we'll be able to communicate through Morse code from tooth or from Bluetooth to Bluetooth through, uh, through Bluetooth <laughs> as well. <laughs> and also the teeth, we might just paint them blue as well, because then it will make more that's sense. True. So that's next week in, in Brazil. And it will have a, we'll have one week uh, in, intensive with 16 people working on it. Also, um, in, we created the Cyborg Nest. Uh, this year in, in London, where we are actually offering sensors for other people. The first sense that we are offering this is the north sense. It can be implanted here in the center of your body. And whenever you face north, you feel a vibration. So it gives you a, a sense of orientation. If you have this vibration when you face north for several months, it, it will probably become subliminal. So you will feel the north without even noticing the vibration anymore. So this is uh, something that uh, a few hundred people will have very soon, because it will be sent to people around the fall. Um, yeah, my, my current project now that I'm collaborating with some people that are here with ThoughtWorks, um, I'm moving like the, the seismic sense down to my feet because it feels like more natural to feel earthquakes on your feet. And I'm, I'm also adding location because now I just know when there's an earthquake, but I don't know where in the world. So this, I will know if it, the earthquake happens very far from where I am or very close. And also, like my, ne my next project is to feel the seismic activity on the moon, because we feel that if we use internet as a sense, we can explore things that are happening very far from where we are, like in the other side of the planet or even in the space. So if we all use, uh, if we all send our senses to space rather than be astronauts, we can become astronauts and explore space while we are here, but through our senses. Yeah, I mean, since 2014, I've been connecting to NASA's International Space Station so that I can sense the colors from space. At the beginning, it was overwhelming because there's lots of colors there that are very high pitched, so it was overwhelming. But then I'm getting used to connecting to, to the station, and then I'm getting used to receiving the colors from space. So yes, it's extending our senses beyond our bodies, but also beyond our planets. So in, in the future, we might able, be able to connect all our senses in other planets. Also, when we have 3D printers that can 3D print our DNA, we might be able to 3D print ourselves in other planets. So instead of traveling to other planets, we'll just need to 3D print ourselves in Mars, and then use the internet to extend our senses to Mars, and then feel that we are there. Uh, and even have our body there without having to physically travel in the way we're doing now. Uh, this is our little experiments of, of sensing space. Also, sharing these experiences by doing space concerts where I amplify the sounds from my head to the audience. The first concert, I had to stop because I was uh, getting dizzy of so many colors from space. But the audience had already left, so it was fine. It was too <laughs> noisy. The second concert, someone in the audience had an um, epileptic attack, what is, uh, yeah, a, a, a seizure. So we had to stop as well. We'll do a concert here now. So we we'll do <laughs> <laughs> it will do just five minutes. And then, um, well, what I'm working now on with uh, Orian and Sam in, at ThoughtWorks here in New York, we are developing a new sense. Uh, I've had this sense for 12 years now, so I feel I'm ready to add a new sense, completely different from color, and it's the sense of time. We all have a sense of time, but we don't have an organ for the sense of time. There's no species that has an organ for the sense of time. So this is developing an organ that will allow me to feel time. It will be a crown between the skin and the bone, circular, and then I'll feel different heat depending on the time. So it will take 24 hours for the heat to go around my head. So once I have it, I will know automatically what time it is because I'll feel the heat around my head. But then the, the question is whether or not this becomes my perception of time. If I have this for several months or years, I might not feel the heat anymore, but I'll feel the time it is. So then when this point happens, then I'll be able to modify the speed in which the heat goes around my head in order to change my perception of time. So if I want time to go faster, I'll change how fast I want the heat to go around my head. And then in theory, and my perception of time will, will be different. Or if I want to travel in time, I will be able just to turn around the heat several times, and then I'll, I'll be traveling in time. Or if I'm jet lag, or if I'm traveling, I might be able to put it in flight mode, and then I might have less, um, 
less jet lag if I make it travel to the, with the speed of the plane. So it's an experiment of taking Einstein's theory of time relativity into a, a sense and into a sensory organ. And this will be more or less ready this year. At least we'd have a prototype, which is usually an exosense. There's exoskeletons, which are but we also create exosenses, which are senses that are permanently outside for a while until your brain gets used to it. And then once the exosense is accepted by the brain, you can then have it implanted. So this is something that w will happen here in New York this now, year. And now, now that we feel that Neil and I are cyborgs, that we actually don't feel closer to machines or to robots, we feel closer to nature and to other animals. Because I feel closer to the planet, because it's very different to know that the planet is moving than to feel that in your body that the planet is constantly moving. And also we think that we can get very inspired by all the senses that animals have. Because if we experience the world through, through senses that other animals have in, in our own nature, our experience of the planet would be very different. Yeah, we both think we are experiencing the renaissance of our species. We are the first generation that can actually really design what senses we want to have, what uh, organs we want to have. We can actually design what species we want to become. We can either get inspired by species that have senses and organs that we don't have and add them to our uh, our bodies. We actually identify ourselves as trans species because we are uh, creating or adding senses and, and organs that other species have. So we define ourselves as trans species. And in the same way that the 20th century saw transgender uh, becoming normal, I think in the 21st century we'll see how trans species also will be more and more normal. We'll be meeting people with new senses and new organs. Some of these senses and organs will be uh, known by other species. Some of them will be new because, uh, for example, internet connection is a, a new sense that will only be uh, used in, in certain cases. Uh, but we'll see that we'll be able to decide what type of species we want to become. And that's th the exciting thing that we are experiencing now, especially when we have uh, the option of 3D printing new organs. Uh, we won't even need electronics anymore. We'll be able to modify our genes and create um, also uh, organic body parts. So the fact that we are now using technology will probably be obsolete in a few decades, and we'll start using 100% organic uh, organs, uh, new organs, and also we'll be modifying our senses. So instead of, in my case, perceiving ultraviolet and infrared with a chip, it will be by modifying my genes. So that's probably the end of the century. But we're both very excited about the possibilities that we can now start to explore. Um, just to end, I think just this, this is just something extra that we are presenting very soon. It's a, a new type of uh, clothes. It's um, a fashion a show that we are presenting in October in the Queen's Museum. It's um, close for the post-wearable uh, generation, so people who don't want to wear technology, people who want to become technology, will also need new type of clothes. In my case, there's no hoodies with holes in it, so I can't wear a hoodie because <laughs> there's no uh, brand that creates uh, hoodies for people that have antennas. Also, people who have the chip here, uh, they need to charge themselves. So there's, uh, there'll be t-shirts with holes here so that they can plug themselves. Or they'll also have a door. And also, we design different types of clothes for different types of cyborgs, which will pre be presented uh, uh, in October 8th at the Queen's Museum. You're all invited. It will be a catwalk where the models will be cyborgs. There'll be 10 different types of cyborgs. And they'll be wearing clothes adapted to this, this new technological bodies. That's okay. it. Thank you very much for listening. Now we're gonna do... I'll be playing the colors from space. I am. Are we... And Moon will be performing the earthquakes that she feels during the, these five minutes. If there's no earthquakes, there'll be no much drumming. But, there's um, always... <laughs>